So as the people of God and as people in general who are constantly trying to improve themselves and make a difference in the world, <clears throat> many times we can have a focus on the areas that need the most work. And I think, that's, I think that's a natural and a normal inclination to see areas where we come up short and to be thinking about how we can improve those areas where we come up short. The danger is, though, <clears throat> that we focus only on the things that we get wrong and never really think about anything that is right. And sometimes we can... Um, we can get down on ourselves or we can get down on other people because we think that we see so many things that need to be improved, we think, oh, well, everything is just terrible and everything is falling apart. And some of the times when it comes to ourselves individually, we're afraid to look at things that, that we have done in a positive light because we're afraid. For some reason, that sounds like a lack of humility if we admit that we have done something well at a certain point in our lives. Listen, to admit in private that I to myself between me and God that some things have gone well is not hum, is not arrogance okay humility is not self debasement okay a lot of people have that idea humility has two parts of it there you have two extremes of humility one is or, or <clears throat> two extremes to humility. One is the side of arrogance, which believes I accomplish everything on my own. The other side is where you degrade yourself down into, I'm such a terrible person, you know. Uh, you know, you, had a, you did a good job today. No, well, you know, I'm terrible. That's not humility. Okay? Humility is seeing yourself for reality. There are some things that I've gotten right. There are a lot of other things that I've gotten wrong. And I'm simply trying to improve. Sometimes when <clears throat> uh, a, a couple may come and we're, we're dealing and confronting marriage issues, one of the first things that's, that's always going to happen is I'm going to talk to them individually and then I'm going to, as I talk to them individually, I'm going to tell them, okay, give me, just start listing and I will write. You tell me everything that is wrong with your spouse. Because that's what's on their mind. That's what's in the forefront of their mind. They've hit an impasse in their relationship and they can't see past what's going on. They can't see past the things that are bothering them. So I tell them that. And usually that's not, I mean, that's not hard at all. They're not really caught off guard by it. That makes sense. That's why they came to seek help. And so they'll list off all the things that they're displeased with. But then they're never ready for the next part of the exercise. Because exercise two is, okay, now tell me what you appreciate about them. And one of the reasons why I have them do that is because I want them to see that one of the things that we can do is we can get so caught up with what's in front of us and get bogged down in the issues that we're having now that we can forget the solid foundation upon which our relationship rests which will enable us to work through the issues up here. And so we think about what is good. And so this morning and this evening we're going to go through this and I want us to think about some things that are good here. And... Um, we're going to break this into two sections. This morning, we're going to focus on the God side of things. There are some things about God that make this place a good place to be. But tonight, we're going to focus more on the, I guess you'd say, human side of things. Things that we are doing. Things that are helping us progress in a way that we need to be progressing. Okay? And it's important that we do these things. And it's important, I think, as a matter of fact... I personally keep a running list of things that I believe that we are doing well. And part of, the, part of the reasons of that are, number one, you see God's faithfulness. Number two, you see that even if we have a moment of difficulty and frustration, you pull that piece of paper out and you start reading it and you think, wow, this is really not that big of a deal. And so I want us to think about it this morning 
through the lens of the presence of God in our midst. And the reason why I think it's imperative that we start there is because <clears throat> if we focus only on what we're accomplishing, listen, there are churches all over our nation that if you look at their accomplishments individually, what the people are doing, how they are growing, some of the things that are going on there, it's impressive. And that can lead us to thinking that we're being successful if we focus on those things. But here's the truth of the matter. Just because crowds are swelling doesn't mean you're doing the will of God. And just because everyone is chattering and everyone is talking about all the things that you're doing and you're always in the limelight, that does not mean that God is present in your midst. And so it's imperative, as with so many other things that we've talked about so many times, that we keep a balance of what is going on. We not overemphasize one above the other, but that we understand and we remember these foundational truths. And, you know, <clears throat> you may be sitting there thinking, when you see these three points we're going to talk about this morning come up, you think, well, duh, this is obvious and this is kind of boring. I know this. But do you really? Because it is so easy to look at these things and be like, well, duh. But it's another thing to truly sit and meditate upon the reality of what we're saying. So, someone comes up and says, and this happens quite a bit when I'm away at conferences and other places. A lot of us will get together and we'll talk and we'll see. And the, common, the question is commonly asked, so what's good? wherever you are that's the question what's going well well <clears throat> I want to try and answer that question number one what's good here the first thing that's good is that God is still our father and that truth can never become boring to us you see <clears throat> God is so the when we talk about the fatherhood of God, God is, all, is the father of all mankind in one sense. And then he's the father of a select few in another sense. Okay? So in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, when God forms man from the dust of the ground, he creates his body and lays it out there on the ground. And then he breathes into man's nostrils the breath of life, the intimacy of kiss and transference of life from God into his creation. And man animates and becomes a living being. And from that point forward, God always attaches the soul to the body. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 1. God forms the spirit of man which is in him. Okay? There's a, a close relationship between the soul and the body of human beings. And so in that sense, every single human being that has ever lived or ever will live, they are the children of God in that sense. And that's picked up even in the New Testament when talking about resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. But there's a second side in which God is also our Father, which is a more specialized sense. Because even though God is our Father physically, we have done things spiritually that have harmed that relationship. And have severed that relationship. And so it must be restored. And so God becomes our father spiritually. Right? So Hebrews chapter 2. This long discussion of Psalm 8. Talking about praising God and considering the frailty of man. And how God cares for man in the midst of his greatness. In Hebrews chapter 2 it shows us that Christ became like us. And identified as a human being. That he might bring many sons to glory. That he's not ashamed to call us brothers and thus we share a mutual father. So when we think about the fatherhood of God. Listen, we, we could spend a long time looking at different elements of the fatherhood of God. But the reading a moment ago tells us something about the attitude with which we should consider being children of God. When John says, behold, King James, behold, other modern translations, see... The idea is a very vivid Greek term. See or consider or to contemplate. Behold what kind of love the, that God has bestowed upon us. 
And what's that love that captivates John? What is that idea that's captivating John? That we should be the children of God. I hope that never makes sense to me. I hope that calling God my Father never makes sense to me. Because I think if it ever makes sense, I feel like I've arrived. I feel like I've earned that moment. Then I've missed the whole point. The God of the universe created me and then recreated me in Christ, adopted me, and made me his own. Listen, I don't know about you, but I know myself pretty well. And I know exactly what my rearview mirror has in it. And the fact that he wants anything to do with me is pretty hard to fathom. Because I can look back there and I can see 10,000 reasons why he should not have anything to do with me. And why he in his son, when he sees me through his son, he finds every reason to have something to do with me. God is our Father. We belong to God, and that matters at so many different levels. Think about how it changes the way that we pray. When Jesus was teaching disciples about the the nature of not doing things to be seen by others, he begins what some people call the Lord's Prayer. It's actually more accurately referred to as the model prayer. He's giving a structure of things, uh, kind of an idea of what praying looks like. And he begins that prayer by saying what? Our Father. Notice the hour is plural. He's already talking about in that prayer the community aspect. Our Father. Some, a Father that we all share in common. Our Father in heaven. Or in chapter 7 when he says, Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be open. And what man among you? Listen to him. What man among you? If his son asks for a fish, would give him a snake. Or if he asked for bread, would say, here's a rock, go gnaw, go gnaw on it. And he says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does God give good things to those who ask him? The fact that we belong to God and his disposition toward us is he desires to hear us, And he desires for us to come to him. I was thinking about last night. I was sitting in my uh, um, the chair in our room where we have a little sitting area, and uh, that's where I do some reading and stuff like that. I have a reading chair over there in the corner. And uh, the boys, as I was sitting there reading and, and studying, I was looking out and and it faces our bed and the boys had climbed up there and they were watching something and they were giggling and they were just lost in the innocence of youth and I couldn't help but think about how lucky I was to be able to see that and what joy those little laughs the purity of their laughs bring And then to think that God thinks of me that way and he thinks of you that way. And when we come together and when we fellowship and when we're, uh, you know, cutting up in the foyer and cutting up before things go on. God delights in that the same way we delight to see our children having fun with each other. He delights in that. And so... When we think about his fatherhood, it even extends beyond that, even into patience. The way that he is extremely patient with us in Psalm 103, an important psalm, I think we should spend a lot of time talking about it, Um, but we won't right now, so just study that on your own sometime. But anyway, in Psalm 103, he says, as a father pities his children, or as his mercy is higher than the heavens so far, and, and his mercy is great toward those who fear him, and as a father pities his children. So God pities us because he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. 
that we have a father who understands what it means to be patient. Now, the reason sometimes that's hard for us to understand is because sometimes as parents, we are not patient. We forget that we're dealing with children and we expect our adult heads to sit on, their ch- on that child's body. They don't know. And one of the things I constantly have to ask myself when I'm dealing with something is, does he really know what he's done? Now there's a difference if we've had the conversation, I've explained it to them, and they go ahead and do it anyway. But even then, God extends patience and understanding. And that's who we have amongst us. That's who we belong to. We we are in his family. It's not, he's not an abusive father. He's not an abrasive father. He's not one that stands over and is demeaning and overly demanding. He's one whose most natural instinct is to nurture and care for us. And I'm going to tell you, if, if a church ever gets that truth deep down in their being, it changes them. Because we begin to understand that what we do, the work that we do on behalf of God, we're not doing it because we're worried He's going to send us to hell. We're doing it because we love Him more than anything else in the world. Why wouldn't I want other people to know Him? It also makes us feel secure in the sense that, you know, isn't it amazing how much easier it is to live life when you're not looking over your shoulder worried that God's fixing to crush you. Because a lot of people, they have lived their entire lives with that notion. And they've never known the freedom that comes from understanding a loving and compassionate Father. So that's the first side. The second side, as we think and continue to think through the Godhead, is that Jesus is our Savior. I understand all three members of the Godhead are involved in our salvation, 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, and several other places. But Jesus, that's his self-pronounced mission when he came into the world. Study the mission statements of Jesus sometimes uh, throughout the gospel accounts. This is one of the most notorious ones, where he says, after coming to Zacchaeus' house... He says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. Those are twofold. You see the T-O? All right? Those are purpose statements. This is why I've come, to seek and to save. I have come down after my creation. This is John chapter 1. He came to his own. He literally came to his own. He stepped out of heaven, put on flesh, and came to his own. He came to his creation and looked them in the eyes and pleaded with them. That's what he's saying. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. Even a tax collector who was a cheat, who did things that were, many people believe to be unspeakable, that were traitors, that turned their back on God. Jesus looked at him, he looked up in that tree and he saw that little man. What is so interesting to me about that whole account is this. Zacchaeus thought that he was there seeking Jesus and he didn't even realize Jesus was there seeking him. I love that. And it's a wonderful thing to watch when people show up and they think, I'm going to sit through this, but I ain't going to enjoy it. I'll be there, but I I don't have to be happy about it. And then all of a sudden they find themselves captivated. This was Paul's own mantra. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, Christ Jesus, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. In a line, I stand first. Or as he would say in Galatians 2.20, to the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If I believe that, 
If a church believes that, if a church believes that they are loved by God, that they were worth enough for Jesus to step down and to die for them, and all of the horrendous elements that are around in it, it makes them different. You're no longer just practicing what are the, the common church growth steps and manuals and all the ridiculous things that come up. You see, this is the problem. <clears throat> Too many people are concerned with cutting edge and flair. Cutting edge and flair will get you a crowd, but it won't keep you one. If you want to be a millionaire, what's one thing you've got to learn how to do? Save money. You cannot spend more money than you make. People say, well, that's simple. That's right. But explain to me why there are so few millionaires. People say, you got to do more than that. I know, I'm not that naive. But you got to at least do that. So people say, well, what we need are we need all these crazy inventions. And I'm not against different programs and different things that go, I'm certainly not. But if you're looking to a program to believe that's the magic bullet, it's not the magic bullet. The program that the church needs most is people who believe that they have a Savior that came from heaven and sought them. And if they believe that, it changes the way they interact with people in the world. It changes the way they see people in the world. It changes the way they themselves seek people. Jesus in our midst will do that. He purified us from our sins. He loosed us. Revelation 1 and verse 5 translates, more modern translations, He freed us from our sins. Other translations will say He washed us from our sins. The term is the idea, it's the original term, luo, which is the idea of, of detaching us. So it's like sin was attached to us like a cancerous growth or like a heavy burden that we could not escape or being placed within a jail. And Jesus frees us. He cuts the cord and it's loose. joy and freedom and his saving work puts us in a place with other people who are have enjoyed the same experience and then puts them on a mission to help the rest of the world number three <clears throat> the spirit is our teacher the spirit of God is our teacher in John 16, when Jesus was talking to the disciples in one of his farewell discourses, he said, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. But whatever he hears, that will he speak, and he will glorify me. One of the Spirit's functions, not his only function, but one of the functions, one of the main functions that we see spoken of, connected to him throughout Scripture, is his teaching. That is, his inspiration, him coming alongside individuals in the first century times and helping them to communicate the message of the gospel correctly so that it could be preserved for all of time. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, but the idea is origin, interpretation is somewhat misleading. It, but it says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved or borne along by the Holy Spirit. That is, he's carrying them along. He's telling them what to say. He's communicating it through them. This is why Jesus would tell them, when you go to stand before leaders in that hour, don't worry about what you're going to say because it's going to be given to you. The Spirit will make sure that you know how to make an adequate defense. And so the Holy Spirit is our teacher providing this revelation for us that this has to become central to everything that we do. And I don't think that point can be emphasized enough. That understanding, <clears throat> and I'll be honest with you, my obsession with understanding what this book says 
is not about disproving the world. It's about knowing what God said. And there's a difference in those two approaches. There's a difference in those two approaches. We simply, if you have, if if a church becomes a place where people simply want to hear the Bible. And simply hearing the Bible is not me standing. Listen, if you wanted me to, I could stand here every Sunday and in every sermon I could quote you a hundred verses. It's not hard. It's really not. When I was in preaching school, we had to memorize three to five hundred every, every quarter. Like, it's not hard. But just, just because I'm rattling verses off to you doesn't mean I'm explaining them. It doesn't mean that you're learning them. And what's interesting... <clears throat> Is, and I'm not opposed to stacking up verses. There are times when we do that. But it's very interesting to go and watch people. I'm very interested in, in watching how people interact with what the Bible says, what they find interesting, what they don't find interesting. What are their emotions around it? How do they communicate it? And you know, I, there have been some scenarios where I've been in where I, I go in and I teach. And if I'm talking about background things, things to help us understand what the text is actually saying, some people have absolutely zero interest in it. Because some people are looking for an experience. What they want you to do is to pluck the string of their emotion by giving them talking points. And as long as you get up and you pluck the string of emotion, they'll love you because they'll never have to think about themselves. But if you take Scripture in and lay it open and lay it out, I'm not opposed. I believe all preaching and all teaching should touch the emotion of the individual, but not before it has been properly informed by what God has said. It can't happen. Otherwise, that, how do I know that the emotion is what God wants it to be? And furthermore, the unfortunate truth is that sometimes God can't get in a word edgewise because we're not actually quoting him. We're not actually citing him. But in this place, in the classes where I have sat, and I sit in them regularly, we expect the Bible to be taught. We expect it to be taught. And that's a good thing. But further, <clears throat> when you think about the Spirit's work as our teacher, His presence in our lives is also, as we've mentioned many times before, which is why we won't dwell on it long here, in Ephesians 1 and verses 13 and 14, His presence, His indwellment in our lives is the down payment of the fact, of the promise that God has made to us that heaven is ours. He dwells in us until the time when the redemption of the inheritance comes. And so, <clears throat> what is good here? Well, first of all, God is our Father. Second of all, Jesus is our Savior. And third, the Spirit is our teacher. And listen, if those three things aren't true, you don't really have a church. You have a group of people that get together. 
Oh, but we do good things for our community. A lot of places, God is not central, and they do good things for their community. And I'm not knocking them. I'm saying that does not make them a church. How can you have a church that belongs to Christ if you don't let him in? And so these are the most fundamental and important elements. And as we grow and grow deeper into these things, other things start feeling the echoes and the ripple effects of this. And so this morning, <clears throat> the question we need to ask ourselves is, where is our relationship with our God? Not, oh, we're excited because we got some new programs and, hey, we're going to get new pews. Listen, if God's not here, I don't care about the pews. If I'm not right with God, a new pew doesn't matter. It just makes me more comfortable as I sit in my sin. And so where is your relationship with our God this morning? If you've never become a Christian... It's not where it needs to be. But if you'll come to him with a penitent faith, confessing Christ to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, he'll welcome you into his family. Or maybe as a New Testament Christian, I have not been who I need to be. Maybe I'm just struggling with other things. Whatever it is, that's what we are here to do. We're here to help one another. And if we can help you this morning, we want to as we stand and sing this song.